How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. Hello, you're listening to DNA Today, a genetics podcast and radio show. I'm your host, Kira Deneen. DNA Today informs you on what's happening in the genetic world. During my broadcast, they educate you, the public, on genetic and health topics through event coverage, news stories, book movie reviews, and interviews. Guests include genetic counselors, researchers, patient advocates, and professors in the field of genetics. Joining me today is Heather Z. She is a patient advocate with two rare brain tumors and a hereditary cancer syndrome called Cowden syndrome. So she's going to share a little bit about her story and what she's learned and kind of educate us on her journey. So thanks so much for coming on the show, Heather. Oh, thank you. I'm just tearing up just hearing that intro. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Of course. Yeah. I mean, anytime that, you know, we can get a patient advocate on the show is is really a great experience because you guys are really really experts in your specific syndrome or disorder yes. compared to yes. other people. Sometimes you know more than an average doctor. Actually, probably most uh, of the time you know more than an average doctor. That's absolutely right. That is absolutely correct. And I'm finding that more and more as this new road continues for me. You're kind of like the almost uh, hidden experts. I feel like people don't, when they think of an expert, they always think of a doctor, or researcher, or professor. Right. We have, to, we have to shine a little bit more light on you guys. Yes. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is just an amazing opportunity. So let's start out with kind of where your journey began with um, going through and, and, you know, from first maybe having symptoms or um, learning about things to actually having diagnoses um, and the different kind of obstacles you've experienced. So kind of start us out at some point. Sure, sure. Um, This all happened in um, 2011. And in the spring of 2011, I was kind of getting these weird headaches. I called them pressure headaches. Um, and it would start at the base of my skull and my vision would get shaded. Really weird. Um, I thought I was having like a mini stroke. Um, and I went to com- some of my doctors and a few of them said, oh, it's migraines. And I said, I get migraines. These are not migraines. This is something different. And Finally, um, it was mid-July, one of my doctors sent me to have a CT scan, and that's where the um, tumors were diagnosed. And so from July 18th was the actual diagnosis date. I had nine days of absolute whirlwind, and then I had my first brain surgery on July 27th. So you're, you're talking about what, about two weeks later from being diagnosed, actually going into brain surgery. It was nine days. Nine and days. Wow. That, my math was a little off there. <laughs> no, it, it, it was a whirlwind of, of terror and fear and just all these emotions that were just so hard for me to manage. Um, but I started my blog that next day, July 19th. And I'm really grateful that I can look back on those early blog posts that week during those nine days and just ponder about that time and be grateful for my healing and and that I have that documented, you know, somewhere out there on the Internet. So during these nine days, I mean, I I can't imagine how hard that must have been and just so scary of Mm -hmm. not knowing that much information how mm-hmm. much how much were you given from doctors and other healthcare providers in terms of information and also kind of a little bit of counseling because that's that's a lot to take in not a whole lot of either to be very honest my neurosurgeon terrified my mom and I and I didn't like him and I was scared of him and it it just added you know fuel to to these emotions that I had never felt before and he wouldn't give us really a definitive, I think it's benign or I think it's malignant. He was just middle of the road. He was not giving us anything, um, which I mean, I guess I could look back and say, okay, that makes sense because he didn't know, but there was not a lot of counseling. There was not a lot of preparation, what to expect from brain surgery. Um, it, it was tough. It was tough. But I have a, an amazing family who um, 
just kind of carried me, you know, in prayer and a lot of friends and strangers praying for me. It was just, it was just a, I'm getting anxious just thinking about it again, but it was a, it was an interesting time, but I'm so glad that I'm, I'm past that. And caregivers are just so important to have that support system and everything. And, you know, really appreciating people that are in those roles, kind of giving them the credit they deserve. Correct. For any um, healthcare providers that are listening right now, what would you suggest for people that are, you know, you're seeing it from a patient perspective, but Mm -hmm. kind of giving them a little bit of feedback, how could have they changed that experience for you to be a little bit more, um, not necessarily positive, because obviously it's it's so uh, tragic and scary, but how could they have kind of helped you with either information or, I don't know, that counseling aspect what, what, what do you want to say to them, basically, to say, oh, we need to change wow. this part. This is what you can do better. That is such an amazing question. I And now I just want to add, too, that my neurosurgeon and his staff, I love them now. I mean, they are amazing, and I, I you know, get teary-eyed when I think about them. I'm so grateful for them. Um, but I just wish there would have been a little more... It might sound trite, but even hand-holding, a little more um, physical, you know, Heather, it's going to be okay, but this is what we need to do. Um, you know, we're going to have to go in and, you know, just just more of the human touch, for lack of a better phrase. It doesn't have to, I don't mean like a physical touch, but just... Explaining things from one human to another, not necessarily a provider Correct. to patient, a little more exactly. human. Exactly, exactly. That That's very well said, very well said. Um, and again, now I said I love them and I love the office and I love the staff and they're just amazing. Um, I just wish during that nine days prior, there would have been a little more, yes, human to human. Mm-hmm. Heather, it's going to be scary, but you can do it. Like, you we're know, here Heather, for you gonna, and we're going to walk you through yes, this process. Yeah. Yes. It's going to be painful, but you're going to be okay. Um, you know, th- those types of of conversations um, would have, I really th- think, gone so far. Now, following having surgery and kind of healing from that and everything and recovering, where did you start learning about hereditary cancer syndromes and, and that <laughs> aspect of things? Well... I'm very blessed now that I've connected with other people with rare diseases and even Cowden syndrome. I've heard, I'm going to say horror stories of how long it's taken people to actually get diagnosed. It can be years, especially for rare disorders. Mine, I think was four months from July to October. That that may be the um, shortest that I've heard. I mean, I haven't heard a ton, but still. Sure, sure. Well, how blessed I am is my neurosurgeon when, you know, the surgery was done um, and he, based on the type of tumor, the tumors are called gangliocytoma. And um, evidently, he had seen this type of brain tumor at his residency, wherever he was in training. And so he then told my mom and another one of my doctors that I was really close to at the time, I think she has Cowden syndrome. Wow. (laughs) And everybody said, what's Cowden syndrome? And he said, well, you better go look it up. And so sure enough, um, I had blood taken to have the um, testing for the P10 mutation. And in October, it came back um, positive for the P10 mutation. So Based on this neurosurgeon, knowing what he did, I really give him so much credit and so much respect for kind of getting the ball rolling. And it's so important for doctors to not only know, and other healthcare providers, to not only know um, kind of the most common types of syndromes, disorders, yes. things, but yes. to at least be aware that there are other things we kind of say like think zebra and not horses sometimes it's yes. usually a horse but sometimes it could be that zebra, it's a, zebra. a rare yes. disease so yes. um it's it's amazing and very fortunate that your your personal doctor oh. knew about a rare disorder that you ended up being positive for yes yes and i it, it, so so well said you're you're saying it so succinctly and once it came back con- c- confirmed for the p10 mutation 
and I think this happens for maybe most everyone that has some sort of a rare disease, I was able to look back and connect dots um, throughout it all makes my medical sense in history. Retrospect. Absolutely. I had thyroid cancer in 2003, and that's one of the, what I call them, the red flags for Cowden syndrome, was thyroid cancer, uterine cancer, and breast cancer. So those well, are the I, cancers that are at an elevated risk for people that have Cowden syndrome compared to the general population. Well, yes. What I was told was, in my research, was those three. However, now there are more cancers um, than just those three. You know, I, I sometimes look back in hindsight and go, wow, if we would only have known in 2003 when I had my thyroidectomy and my goiter was 10 times larger than normal, I wonder how different things could have been had we known about Cowden syndrome then and been checking about, um, you know, monitoring and screenings and that sort of thing. And so you mentioned that um, going through the genetic testing, you uh, were found to have a P10 mutation. So I want to say that so people know. Uh, yes. That is, is one gene that is linked to Cowden syndrome, but there are others, right? Yes. I should probably be well-versed in those, and unfortunately I'm not. Um, That's okay. The I, concept is that there's there's more than just yes. one gene for, for different things, including breast cancer. People know Correct. BRCA, Angelina Jolie, but the same concept applies to a lot of different syndromes and their cancer relationship. Yes, and thank you for mentioning that. That is part of one of my things that I'm so passionate about is P10 mutation also has an 85% lifetime risk of breast cancer. Which is very and similar so, to BRCA mutation. That's about 85% risk. Absolutely. And I hear so much online and in my research, BRCA, BRCA, I was negative. Well, wait, there's more. There's other things. P10 is just as big, just as bad, just as worrisome. And so you want but to shout it, shout it from the rooftop saying that if you <laughs> if patients are negative for BRCA, do not stop your searching. Do not stop your genetic yes. testing. Yes. Shouting it loud and clear to anyone that will hear. P10 mutation, look at it, think about it, research it, bring it up. Um, it's so important. And I don't think it's really as rare as, as the numbers say. Um, I've read that it's one in 200,000 people. I think it's way more than that. I think it's just underdiagnosed. And, and that makes sense that um, because it's considered a rare disease and a lot of people don't know about it, a lot of people aren't being tested and then not yes. identified as having Correct. it. Correct. And so how is um, a P10 mutation typically inherited? Do you know the inheritance pattern or um, if it's usually <sighs> in other family members? I know, well, I, I believe, I, I was told that it's auto, autosomal, mm -hmm. where it can be, I believe, only one parent needs to have the mutated gene. Um, Which would be autosomal dominant, if you okay, just inherit yes. it from one. Yep. Yes, that, that, I believe that's what it is, autosomal dominant. And we don't know, my hunch is that I was a sp spontaneous mutation. My hunch is that I was just the first in the line. Um, when I when I did I did see a genetic counselor at one point, and we did my family um, tree, my family pedigree, and we went generations back as far as we could go. I do not have one aunt, one female family member on either side, my father or my mother, that has breast cancer, thyroid cancer, or uterine cancer. And to me, that was so bizarre because I've read stories and I've connected with people where women and aunts and sisters and female cousins, you know, have breast cancer and uterine cancer and thyroid cancer. So we don't know. We don't know if I inherited it from my mom or my dad. It's certainly you possible know. you could have. And Correct. no one has... Um, develop cancer because that can also be the case. We talk about elevated risk, but that it's not yes. you're going to develop a cancer. Yes, yes, yes. It's just a very, and, very high probability. And my my oncologist thinks that I probably inherited it from my dad. 
he's deceased. He's been deceased um, since uh, the early 2000s. And um, no one else in my family has any interest at this time to see if they have the P10 mutation as well. Which is a personal decision. It's um, correct. It's, it's very, uh, it can be very emotional um, and kind of to make that decision. And there's a lot, a lot that goes into it. Um, a lot of information you can get from genetic testing, but um, yes. for some people, it's just not the right decision for them. So that's also yes. something important to say is, you know, it's, it's not for everybody. And it was hard for me to kind of swallow that pill at first, but, you know, it's been about six years since I was diagnosed and, um, there hasn't, you know, it hasn't come up in conversation and I'm just, we're just living our life and just doing the best that we can with what we have. And, um, and I respect their decision, um, as, as hard as it is for me to swallow, swallow, I respect their decision. Yeah. It's a, it's a kind of, it's a tricky topic, especially with family members, if you have, you know, differing viewpoints on it. Now from your genetic testing, have you made any healthcare decisions that, um, like from your testing that, Maybe you wouldn't have if you didn't know about your mutation. Yes. I, I, as I said before, the breast, thyroid, and uterine were always kind of the big three um, that I had heard about. And it's like, oh, we need to be careful of those. Well, I decided to have a prophylactic hysterectomy um, because I kind of joke a little bit that I've had too, too many brain surgeries because I had a total of two. And even though I didn't want to have a hysterectomy, I knew it was time. I knew I was having symptoms and I was having issues and and problems. And I've already decided that I was not going to have children, biological children, because I was not going to risk passing on the P10 mutation myself. I said, let's just get it done. So I had a total hysterectomy in 2013 which was one of the best decisions I ever made. <laughs> and so it's obviously a very hard decision to make. Mm-hmm. How, how did you come to that conclusion? Did you kind of read a lot of other patients' experiences? I mean, I, I personally wouldn't know kind of where to start. I guess you start making a pro-con list, but it's very loaded. It's very loaded. And, and the, the, the decision, the point, the thing that made it the easiest for me to decide... I'm going to have a prophylactic hysterectomy is any chance, even if it was a 5% chance that I would pass on a P10 mutation to a child, that was too much of a risk. Um, And I believe it's 50%. So if if I were married, if it's dominant, then yes, correct. Correct. Um, And I just said, that's it. It's my, it's the decision was not even an issue for me. Because I, I had decided there's no way, knowing what I know, knowing knowing what I know, I will not pass along uh, Cowden syndrome um, to my child. And that's it. Game and, over. And it's prevented, uh, or it's greatly reduced your risk of um, having uterine cancer from having a prophylactic surgery. Correct. Correct. Because it's, it's not even there. So my uterus was kind of unhappy already, and it was starting to get very angry, (laughs) that's how I phrase it. And I said, no, it's time. There's no reason for me to continue because also I I had to have um, screenings that were very uncomfortable and tests that were very uncomfortable to check for uterine cancer. So from the years of 2011 to 2013, you know, every three, probably three months or so, I was having quite painful. I won't get into the details, but, you know, screenings and, and exams to check. And I said, no, I don't want to keep doing this. In some ways it was so, easier to go with a prophylactic surgery because then it's absolutely. kind of something you don't have to worry about anymore. Absolutely. Absolutely. And with that being said, my, my doctors talk a lot about my breasts and want to know if I've thought about having a prophylactic mastectomy. And we have those conversations quite often but I'm not ready for that at this time. If it comes up and I have to address it, then I will address it at that point. But as it stands right now, every six months, I'll either get a breast MRI or a mammogram. 
And then on the alternate, so basically every three months I'm doing something, my oncologist will do a clinical breast exam. Um, so someone is always checking them about every three months. And it's important to note that if you didn't go through genetic testing, you wouldn't have had a prophylactic surgery, right? Correct. And I wouldn't have known the breast cancer risk and I wouldn't have known to get my first mammogram. I think it was around October, 2011 or November. I wouldn't have known to do all of these important screenings. And so testing. it's armed you with a lot of knowledge that you're actively using. Yes, yes. And that was one of the main things my neurosurgeon had said once it came back positive and, and that it was a P10 mutation, is he said, you've got to keep your appointments. You've got to make your appointments. And yeah, not even an option. There's there's no way I couldn't. Right. And you know. with all of, you know, the, the challenges and obstacles that you've gone through, has there been any silver linings in the journey, any positive aspects that's come from kind of all of this um, really hard challenges? It's a, it's a, it's a big question, isn't it? I kind of just threw it out there, but it's a big question. No, I want to sit with it for a minute, but yet I want to be positive and I know how important it is to be positive. But there's also some real life things that are very difficult since getting diagnosed with the brain tumors and then Cowden syndrome. But to keep it positive and to, to answer your question and not to be a negative Nancy, I have been blessed to um, collaborate and connect with maybe 15 to 20 people who are also living with Cowden syndrome. Some people through my blog, some people through Twitter, some people through Instagram. Um, and I remember being an, at breakfast with my mom, and it was October 2011, and I had just gotten diagnosed. And I thought the world was ending. I thought I was the only person in the entire world that just received this news. And if I could go back and tell that Heather, you're not alone. It, it, it just would have just done so much for me. And so meeting people in social media and collaborating with people, when it's used for good, it is amazing. Social media has been such a blessing um, to connect. And there's, set, there's a couple of people that we text each other. We have the same brain tumors. She also has Cowden syndrome. We have all these things in common. And that has just been a really big blessing. It's really like having other teammates that are going through the it same is. process as you and all, Absolutely. you know, I'm, I'm sure you share a lot of the same challenges and just venting to each other, I'm sure is very, yes. um, really great. Yes. Now, for those that maybe are, are in that moment of previous Heather, of, of having a new diagnosis of, you know, maybe Cowden's or just another rare disease, mm -hmm. what would you pass on to them? Are there certain resources that have really helped you? Are there certain support groups? Well, to be honest, I when I first was diagnosed and I looked onto Facebook and I looked onto Facebook groups... And there were some issues, and those weren't right for me. So for some people, I know that they've really been supported and benefit and have felt, have felt a benefit from being in those Facebook support groups. For me, I decided to create my blog, and I decided to have my own space on the internet where I could say whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted, no filter, no holds barred. That has been probably one of the most healing things for me is to have that space where I can just yell and scream and cry. Um, when I was first diagnosed, there was not a P10 foundation at the time. But in the, in the interim and, and with one of the other people that I've connected with who lives out on the east, south, southeast, she's created a P10 foundation. And so that's coming up from the grassroots. Um, so if somebody was new and they didn't really know what to do or how to feel or what to say, I would say take a moment, breathe, 
and then get back on your feet and start looking for others. If there's not someone like you, make your own. You make your own way, blaze your own trail, and people will find you. Well, that's some fantastic advice, I have to say, that you Mm -hmm. uh, are quite an inspiration Mm -hmm. yourself of really being a pioneer in patient advocacy and saying, hey, I'm here, this is what I'm doing, and I want to help people. Oh, thank you. You make me cry. Thank you so Aww. much. Well, for people that want to connect with Heather and read the blog post she's talking about, they can go to hopeforheather.wordpress.com. And the Twitter and Instagram she mentioned is at Z Heather Champ. Thanks so much, Heather, for you know educating us about hereditary cancer syndromes, you know, especially what you have, Cowden syndrome, and really just sharing your story and your experience. You know, it really helps people that are either going through the same thing as you or something similar. And for people that are on the other side and, and wanting to pursue um, being a healthcare provider or currently are. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. I appreciate you more than you know. Of course, yeah. So that about wraps up today's episode of DNA Today. If you want to listen to more episodes, you can go to dnapodcast.com. Um, there's even more information on there uh, about every episode I've done. And you can go um, on Twitter at DNA Podcast to connect. And recently, I've started an Instagram at DNA Radio. So that one's a little different, DNA Radio. If you have questions for myself about any episodes um, or you'd like to be a guest, you can email in at info at dnapodcast.com. And also, if you have questions for Heather that um, maybe you don't want to reach out on social media and publicly say something, thanks for listening. Join me next week to learn and discover new advances in the world of genetics. The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA.